Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 16th uh, installation of the Galen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. Uh, my name is Dwayne Mancini. I'm the founder of Project MedTech and the Project MedTech podcast. Today, we'll be sitting down with Yin He from Amazon Web Services for a fireside chat on technology funding and culture for early stage health tech companies. Um, first, a few housekeeping items and some information on Galen Data. Galen Data is the cloud for medical device makers. The Galen Cloud provides a configurable platform for device to cloud connectivity that is compliant to FDA, HIPAA, and CE Mark standards. Built on 40 plus years of collective experience developing compliance systems in the medical device industry, the company's goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all. It's off the development timeline. For more information, you can always go to galendata.com. So uh, without further ado, Yin, thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, I thought it'd be nice if you could just give a, a brief intro to yourself, your background, and, and what you currently do for AWS. Sure. Well, first of all, Dwayne, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to the chat. And of course, a huge shout out to the, the Galen folks for inviting me to this and for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, my current role at AWS, but also, um, you know, sh sharing a little bit of my story and, and sort of how I navigated um, the startup world a little bit to be where I am. Um, so my background actually probably resonates with a lot of people in the audience, but started um, in a lab. So I have a PhD in molecular biology and genomics, um, did a lot of research on you know, the endoplasmic reticulum, um, trying to understand how the mechanisms of protein folding led to um, you know, neurodegenerative diseases and things like that. Um, so after that, you know, I, I, I so in, in my PhD, right, I wasn't sure sort of what the next step was, but I definitely wanted to explore careers outside of academia. And so I had the opportunity when I was at Cornell doing grad school to, um, to join a, a, an entrepreneurship class. It was offered through the business school. It was specifically for scientists and engineers. And I remember that was kind of my first um, introduction to startup world and entrepreneurship. I knew nothing about it. Um, and then actually through one of my colleagues in grad school, um, you know, I found my way to an early stage biotech startup in the Bay Area. Um, it was called Transcriptic. Um, now it's, uh, there's a name change, it's Stratios. It, it went through, you know, YC backed by Lux and DCVC. And we were building really cool technology to similar to actually what some of you all do. It's connecting, right? The basis of it was connecting hardware uh, to, to the cloud. So we were connecting research instruments, so things that you would use for early stage drug discovery or synthetic biology, trying to connect all of that so we could create this uh, you know, remote research environment where all you needed to, you know, to conduct some experiments was a laptop, right, and access to the internet. And of course, you know, at our facility in Menlo Park, we were operating, um, you know, these automated, what we called work cells that had all of these devices that were doing the experiments um, and the, the users would get data back. Um, I was there almost seven years, various roles um, in leadership, you know, oversaw engineers and scientists, um, and then um, also did a little bit on the, the business development side and, you know, sold um, our offerings into organizations like Ginkgo and Eli Lilly to run their automated drug discovery. Um, and then found my way to AWS, where I currently am. I've been here for about two years, currently based in New York. Um, and it's, you know, I feel like I have the coolest job in the world. So um, I'm on the startups team. We actually just work with, you know, startups. It's, it's a global team. Um, we work with startups of all stages and industries, but given my background and others on my team, um, we specifically work to support, um, you know, high priority, high potential healthcare life sciences startups and really on the business development side, really try to do whatever we can to help them, right? Whether that's technology um, or later on, you know, helping with business and go to market motions, doing co-marketing, um, perhaps introductions to potential customers or investors, anything that we can help them um, in terms of you know growth and, and growing and scaling their business. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I, 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 for, I, I did put this on. Uh, I'm a <laughs> chemist as well, and and you can't see the whole thing, but it is a oh, it. chemist tree. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so, anyways, uh, you having your PhD in, in in microbio and and genomics, I figured you appreciate it. Um, so I, I wrote down one question. I'll come back to at the end if we have time, but but. To, to jump right in, um, 
So you're seeing a lot of technology specifically to healthcare. What kind of trends are you seeing current day? Yeah, I think what's top of mind for everyone is still just, you know, going through through COVID, right? And sort of what are some of the the trends or areas where COVID has has surfaced, right? And I think the first one that's really prominent is just the continuing rise, um, rising cost of healthcare, um, which I think has been on this trajectory. Um, but also, I think what's surfaced recently, you know, it's not a new problem, but I think it's just more and more people are becoming aware of it is disparate access, right, to healthcare for certain, you know, communities and populations in the US and globally. Um, and so I think, you know, some of the ways, you know, or areas where I see startups trying to, to help this is, you know, this whole concept of being focused on value based care, right? So, you know, really thinking about how do we shift from um, you know, being very reactive, right? So when somebody's sick, you know, they they come to the hospital, right? We, we take care of them um, to being much more proactive, right? You know, are we able to um, create a more holistic, right? Um, healthcare access and approach to healthcare, one that supports, you know, health and wellness, but also prevention and early intervention. So even before, right, someone comes in and needs a diagnostic. Um, so I'm starting to see lots of startups, right, in that stage, especially in wellness and in prevention. Um, and broadly also areas like mental health and wellness, right? Which all of us can probably use a little bit of after, you know, going through through COVID. Um, the second area, which I think it's all related, but, you know, I think COVID has sort of forced um, healthcare to, to really take a look at where we currently are and drive innovation in healthcare delivery, right? And I think, you know, a lot of this um, is going to, to touch on, right? The digital aspect of delivering healthcare and telehealth. Um, you know, there's tons of articles out there talking about um, the trends of telehealth and kind of speculating whether it's going to last, right, or whether it was just short-lived through COVID. And I actually think, you know, there is going to be a part of the strategy where there's just going to be much more of this digital front door and delivery of healthcare in digital ways. Um, it's going to replace everything, of course, right, but there are large aspects of, you know, primary medicine that it can replace. Um, with that, I think we're seeing huge influx of capital into healthcare, right? Both by, you know, in terms of VC dollars and um, and also VCs themselves raising additional funds, right? So I think all of this really enables um, this, you know, very healthy environment for for fundraising and for healthcare innovation, right? To really become forefront, um, not just supporting healthcare startups, right? But also a lot of these incumbents and enterprises, right, are really able to, to sort of make some bets, right, on where they think they should be in the next couple of years, five, 10 years in terms of healthcare innovation. Um, I think where we're seeing this is, you know, digital first care delivery models, right, so combinations of apps and telehealth and in-person care, um, expanding home care, right, so being much more patient-centric and being able to deliver healthcare where patients need it, right, not have patients come to, you know, these hospitals, right, and, and make that a really inconvenient experience, but, you know, if you're home or you're at work and you're sick or you're going to pick up a prescription, right, and you need some sort of care, um, how do we expand and extend healthcare, right, to all of these aspects of your life? Um, and then related to that, I think, is enabling remote patient monitoring, right? So having wearables, um, being able to collect data on the patient, um, you know, as they're living, right, through their da daily lives and not just when there's an incident or they have to, to go into a healthcare setting. Um, and then lastly, I think data, right, is always part of this whole conversation. Um, and I think that's really where it gets interesting for us at AWS is we're starting to see, especially for this audience from MedTech, right? I think we used to think of MedTech as just these pieces of hardware, right? They were dumb in a sense because, you know, they, they, they were just pieces of hardware, not connected, no software. Um, but we're seeing that's changing as well, right? All of the new devices and, and that's where Galen, I think, plays a critical role in all of this, right? Is every, you know, MedTech device that I've you know, founder that I've talked to, there's some software component somewhere, right? There's some data component somewhere. And now the challenge is figuring out how to tie all of this together. And that's where, you know, having a partner like Galen is really helpful to, to take care of some of that, you know, what we call undifferentiated heavy lift, right? So that you can really focus on the core differentiator of your product and your customers. Um, and the last thing I'll touch on that I'm excited about is I think regulatory guidance is also catching up, right? I think in the past, you know, especially with AI, ML, it's such a buzzword, but, you know, we are seeing it being used um, in actual, you know, real life settings and impacting care. But I think guidance was really slow and always sort of lagging, right? So, you know, there's new proposed 
regulations on how we think about you know modifications to AI ML right software as a medical device models that was just released and so that's super exciting for me to, to see as well because I think it kind of validates that this is the direction where we're going um, but it also helps to set frameworks and guidance for startups especially in regulatory right which is you know I think sometimes a black box to all of us um, and you know anything that we can do to clarify what that framework and regulatory pathway looks like and, and being able to enable continuous learning through these models is going to really drive innovation yeah so, so that was a lot <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there it's all great um uh, to comment on the regulatory piece right i i think that that is a key um uh, a key part a key piece to bring up um you know a lot of times uh as innovation happens the fda is just just behind the the needle of where it is and and that's all you can really expect though right i mean they're they're learning as much as we are so um but but i think them really getting ahead of the software as a medical device in some of those areas is 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 really big um yeah they have you, such a hard challenge right i mean when yeah. you're dealing with patient lives right i mean it's right. it's very easy to say hey it's really you know we're not we're, we're, we're completely risk intolerant right um yeah. But that's just not feasible moving forward. So, you know, I was actually reading through the doc a little bit before this, but it, it's pretty cool. You know, they make it pretty simple. There's this framework, right? It talks about changes um, to three aspects of the product, performance, input, and intended use. Um, and only when you're expanding the scope, right, of intended use, so if you're moving from, I don't know, breast cancer, right, to a different type of cancer, do you actually have to fully go through the cycle of approval again? Um, whereas for the others, right, there's, you know, an easier path, right, to, to demonstrating um, that, um, that, that you can, you know, still use the, the product as is. So it's really good to, to see that, you know, there is this balance, right, between how do we innovate, um, but also obviously taking risk into consideration. Yeah, bingo. And I think, um, you know, especially just with AI and machine learning, it is uh, so complex if you're not a software engineer or, or or in that field. It is hard to grasp sometimes. But um, yeah, so I, I think the other thing you brought up and we can kind of all tie it into one, I mean, like like fitness bands, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people wear them, but, but the evolution of those is a great example of the evolution of uh, the med tech industry in general, right? It's 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 monitoring some type of data, but now it's taking it the next step further, taking that data, putting it up in the cloud, and you can do a lot more with it. Um, and and that is not just on the wearable side or 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 the fitness side, but but it's across med tech in general. So I'm curious. I I don't work for Galen, um, and so I don't understand the cloud as much as some of the other people within Galen do. Where does AWS fit in, right? If, I, if I'm Dwayne Mancini LLC and I have this product and I want to connect it to the cloud to take advantage of, uh, you know, this data, why reach out to AWS? When do I reach out to AWS? What do you provide to me to help me be a successful med tech startup? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and there's probably going to be <laughs> a lot to unpack there as well, and that's why, you know, I, I enjoy my job so much. So, you know, I think when people think of AWS immediately, what comes to mind is, oh, they're a cloud services provider or a vendor, right? Um, and I think, you know, that that's, yeah, yes, of course we do that, right? That's low hanging fruit. Um, but I think, you know, what I've come to learn and what I really appreciate about it is just, you know, we're not just a technology company, right? Especially for startups and, you know, obviously for some of our enterprise companies as well, there's immense resources and programs in place. Um, but, you know, from the startups perspective, because that's who I see the most to help startups, right, with not just their bus you know, business challenges and, and as well as the technical challenges, right? So typically when we talk to startups early on, so, you know, I cover startups early stage and how we define that is anywhere from, you know, university innovation, right, university spin out licensing, maybe you have an, you know, SBIR, et cetera through going through an accelerator, incubator, um, you know, through raising pre-seed seed, right, through an angel or seed investor. Um, so that's, you know, sort of what we gate as early stage. Um, but typically startups in that space, right, when they come to us, it's early on, it's to help with the technology, right? It's, you know, they're still going through product iterations, right? You know, they may not understand, you know, how they can, you know, what, what their data strategy should be, right? Or how to even get started or what is AWS, right? And so a lot of, you know, my time is spent on 
you know, education, right? Um, because I think, you know, even though we cloud is all around us, a lot of people don't know what cloud actually is, right? It's not just, you know, using Dropbox or, you know, things like that, right? There's so much more to that. It's actually, you know, the official definitions on demand, right? Delivery of IT resources. So IT could be anything that your computer does and more, right? So, you know, there's storage, there's compute, there's database, there's, right, security, there's, you know, access management, um, you know, all of the DevOps components, there's IoT, there's AIML, there's analytics, right? Um, and so what AWS has done is, you know, there's 200 plus services. Um, and the best way to think about them is building blocks, right? So if you need storage, there's a series of building blocks or services that fit your storage needs, right? And a, a lot of what we you know, have built, it's, it's purpose built, right? So, you know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, for databases, you just need one database, right? But from working with customers and, and data, that's not true, right? There, you actually need purpose built, built databases to fully leverage and gain the advantage of everything you need out of that database. Um, so that's why there's so many services. And, you know, we have a big event every year called reInvent, which I just came back from it's in Vegas, and that's where new services get get added. Um, so it's always fun to to navigate. Um, so that's why you know I, I really believe AWS has the best and best in terms of breadth and depth of the platform. But of course, what you give up sometimes is ease of use, right, um, and usability, right? Because you know our customers have to you know navigate um, through a lot of information. Um, and so that's where you know we have resources. They're like myself, but much more technical. Um, so they're called solutions architects, right? And they can basically help map whatever your needs or workloads are to AWS services. Um, so where Galen fits in is, you know, we have this, if you imagine sort of this, this pyramid, right? You know, at the very base are, you know, what we call infrastructure, right? So these are the building blocks, the services. Um, customers, you know, who are savvy and, you know, have an engineering background or know how to work with um, AWS, they, they can, you know, basically use these building blocks to build whatever, right? Whether that's a website or a patient portal or maybe, you um, a data lake or a genomics pipeline, right? Or even a, a connected medical device, right? Um, where, where Galen fits in and, and where we have, you know, partners, right? Is sort of building more of these, what we call managed solutions, right? So these are more off the shelf solutions where if you're like, hey, I don't wanna spend my time building this cause either cause I can't, or, you know, as a startup, you have very limited bandwidth and resources, right? Um, and so if you think that this, you know, this infrastructure shouldn't necessarily be differentiating for you, right? What's differentiating is, you know, how you're going to, to build, right, your product and your customers and deliver those features. But this IT infrastructure is not differentiating necessarily. Um, and so that's where, you know, if you can't build it yourself, we have this network of partners, including Galen, who can do it. And I think what's really cool about Galen is, again, they're extremely they're ex experts in this space, right? So it's not just, you know, some of the partners are more generalists, right? They can come and build anything to spec, but I think in healthcare, it's really important to have that industry knowledge and expertise um, so that, you know, they help you navigate, right? And especially compliance security, it's one of those things where it's a black box. And early on, you know, sometimes it's okay, right? To, to have a partner manage that for you. Yeah, I think that's a great point you made there at the end as well, just with it being a regulatory, you know, a regulated environment and we're talking about patient health and, and health records and HIPAA and FDA. It's a lot. So that's that's uh, I think that's a great point. So um, I want to say if you brought up fundraising in your initial um, bullet point, but I'm going to push that to the, the last thing we talk about just because um, I know a lot about that as well, so I'm curious on your thoughts, and I'm, I just imagine we'll talk a lot about that. But I, I do want to cover culture. Um, so on my podcast series, um, I've talked about culture uh, th three or four times now, and the first time I did it, it was like, wow, I should have talked about this way sooner, because when you're a startup company and you're competing for talent and you're competing against the behemoths of the world, like Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's hard to offer the same kind of incentives that Medtronic, Johnson and Johnson, Amazon can 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 offer as a startup. So you really have to focus on culture. But so so not only that, but then there's a side of, do you want to build a successful med tech company? Any person I've ever talked to has been a part of a med tech company or a health tech company has said the team is the most important piece, mm -hmm. right? They'll take a B product, but if they have an A team, they're 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 hopeful that they're, they're confident that company is going to make it. 
And so if you're going to have an A team, you have to have a good culture. So I'm curious, um, and, and I did some reading after we initially talked about, about Amazon's culture. Um, I, I'm curious on your perspective on culture, how Amazon handles it internally. Um, and maybe we just start there and kind of let it let it go from there. But I'm curious. Sounds good. Yeah, I mean, culture is just one of those sort of these huge right ideas it seems like this nebulous definition and if you know it depends on who you ask they all have different definitions and i feel like as i you know kind of go through my career uh, it, it's also changed right for me as well so i think what i've settled on in terms of you know my current definition of culture it, it's sort of like what are the company's values and related to that right how you know as, as people are making decisions, right? And, and, you know, how do these values, right? Or, you know, these statements, right? You always think they're kind of like, you know, typed up and, you know, printed somewhere big in like a lunchroom or something. But, 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 but what do you, what kind of behavior, right? Do you want to drive and incentivize in the people at the company? So I think for me that, that, that's kind of, you know, a, a broad definition, but it really helps me also kind of tie into, you know, sort of the, the leadership principles that we have at Amazon and how we sort of, follow them. But I think ultimately it's it's what kind of behavior, right, do you want to incentivize and drive for the team? You know, I think some people think culture, it's about, you know, benefits, right? You know, do you have all the free snacks and beer and wine in the fridge? And it's like, yeah, that's all great. But at the end of the day, I think what COVID also has shown us, right, is like these are perks, right? Perks is just one component of, of culture, but in no way, I would say, at least in my opinion, the biggest driver, right? I think for people to feel satisfied in their job, it's working, it, it's having clear guidelines of, you know, how they make decisions, right? And so, um, you know, I think one of the examples of this is, you know, in Amazon, right, the culture is kind of defined by um, these leadership principles. So now there's 16 leadership principles, we just had two new ones added. Um, you can Google them, they're, they're public. When you interview, they're actually a core component of, um, you know, how you, uh, how you go through the interview process, right? So they're really assessing you um, on do you exhibit and would you fit in this culture, right, driven by these leadership principles. Um, so, you know, for example, what are some of these leadership principles, right? And like, if you read through them, they're they're, they're kind of obvious, right? They're like no brainer, but I think in practice, it's actually much harder. And I think what I've appreciated about Amazon more than anywhere else I've been is, you know, a lot of people have culture and values and things like that written up, but it's really hard to um, stay consistent and follow them, right? Um, so what I've really appreciated about Amazon is the consistency. You know, I, we joke that this is kind of like a cult, right? Because every day somebody will bring up, you know, a leadership principle as part of their you know, argument or justification for something in daily conversation. And I think that's actually probably a healthy way to do it, right? It, it means that everyone there aligns with the leadership principles. Um, so again, I, I would say, you know, what 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 are some of the, the leadership principles that, that I think are, are best, right? I think um, for me, it's, you know, the, the, the number one, um, I think most well-known leadership principle is customer obsession, right? So that's exactly what it means. It means doing what's right by the customer, right? And again, right, we all feel like we do that, but you know, just thinking back to, to probably some of my decisions, you know, at the startup and, and even before that, right? We didn't always do that, right? We thought what's best for us, right? From the perspective of the startup or what's best for my team or my role, right? Not necessarily what's best for the customer. Um, and I think related to that as a corollary is anticipating what your customer needs or wants right before they figure that out. And I feel like Amazon is, you know, has been notoriously good at that, right? And, and they're not afraid to kind of make these long-term investments and bets, right? Um, sometimes you fail, right? And that's that's part of this, um, but, but that's okay. So I, I would say, you know, that's not necessarily a leadership principle, but I think that's also important to have in the culture is um, we want people to experiment, especially in the startup environment, right? We want everyone to feel like they have ownership to experiment and if you fail that's okay right there's no punishment you know but you have to bring back a learning right you can't just say oh i failed that's that but you have to come back with a learning you need to share it um, and we all need to grow from that so customer obsession customer obsession is a really good one for me the other one that i've really appreciated especially for you know kind of the the, the as, as amazon has grown right is that it's how leadership is able to dive deep. So that's the second one, it's dive deep. Um, you know, it's really being able to 
you know, have individual owners. Um, so everyone, you know, needs to, to know sort of, you know, their numbers, right, what they're achieving, their goals. Um, we all need to know, right, you know, at some level, the all of the different services, right, what they do. Like, I can't just get on the call and say, hey, I'm BD, I don't know, right? Like, that's not acceptable. Um, and I really love that. Maybe it's because I'm a trained scientist who's so detail-oriented. But, you know, when you're talking to leadership, right, and they know the ins and outs of all of the new services, right, it's like, you know, you, you feel ashamed, right, if, if you don't know. Um, so I, I think that, and, and how that plays out, I think, is sometimes you'll be in organizations and there's decisions that are made, um, right, kind of at the leadership level, but you feel like they're made because they don't understand the nuance, right, of, of the details of each of the individual groups or things like that. And so that's where I feel like it's really important, right? If you understand, you know, like as a as a project manager or a product leader, right, I've, I've worked with people where they didn't understand the core technology, right? And, and you know, they were responsible for driving the roadmap and, and it's like, uh, how, how does that work, right? So you really need to, to, to that, that's another one that, that I just really like. Um, and then I think the, the last one that I'll discuss is this kind of this thing around, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but there is a leadership principle around think big, right? So everyone is encouraged to sort of be an owner and, um, you know, that's where the next big idea could come from, right? Is from anybody in the organization, um, you know, and we want to give them the the space and the 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 the, the resources, right? And you know, in terms of time, and and tell them it's okay to to kind of think big, and you know, if there were no limitations, what what could you do, right? And sometimes those ideas turn out to be the best ideas. Again, a, a lot there. Um, everything you said sounds great in principle and this is probably what define what what makes or break a successful organization and, and not a successful organization is everyone can talk about all of this it's just mm -hmm. actually implementing it right so you know i've been a part of organizations that um were really good at this and really poor at this right and the one that you brought up is, is i think one that just rings true to me is is when leadership understands the entire suite of offerings or the entire what the the entire mission of the company and they understand the little the, the other parts of it they don't have to be experts in it but if, mm -hmm. they, if they know they care they understand as a team member makes you feel better about it right so um i think that's great uh, and I, i'm glad yeah, you, it brought helps you develop out. trust right kind of up and down the org and, and that's important right i think you know the, the the best thing we can do is sort of assume the best of our colleagues right because mm -hmm. you know if you assume the worst i mean nothing good can come from that but in order to do that you really have to you know they have to earn your trust right and you have to earn their trust and you can only do that i think through expertise and you know understanding how to dive deep and, and you know kind of having right empathy as well and um and understanding and transparency and communication and all of that um so so Dwayne, i totally agree with you i mean i think again right when i read these it's like when i was interviewing it's like oh well, no duh right like customer should be number one but then if you actually go back right as i was preparing for the interview it was like wow you know what was an example where i didn't put the customer right first um, and there's more than you would like to admit, yeah. right? Because of different pressures or things like that. Um, and that's okay, but I think it really opened my eyes to say, hey, yes, you know, these all seem great in principle, but again, in practice, it's really hard. Um, and I think that goes to touch into hiring, right? Like how do you ensure that once you've established your culture, um, you're going to have people that believe in it, right? So I think that goes to, to the hiring process, right? You absolutely have to hire people that, um, believe right in these values um, that are curious right for dive deep I mean the only way you can dive deep is by being curious right you have to learn so then you kind of work from that and figure out okay how do I assess that in, a, in, a, in an interview right can I ask questions that really shows that this individual is willing to go above and beyond to understand something new etc um, so that's where you know I think um, Amazon has an incredible hiring process as well right you know it's behavioral based but it is about um, you know specifically tied to each of the leadership principles and being able to um, you know everything is about dive deep right they'll ask you why how whatever until there's nothing left to, to ask um, and so I think that's really where it's important to put into place you know an interview process that helps to assess right compatibility with whatever your values are right they don't have to be these they can be something completely different yeah and so uh, the interview process obviously very important for health tech startups because you you really can't afford to get 
many hires wrong. Your 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 timeline of the life of your company mm -hmm. is finite because a lot of times you're raising capital to get to wherever you need to get to. So uh, you only have so long, so you really can't screw that up. So that is something that when I consult with startups too, I always recommend the the interview process. You need to spend a lot of time there, and and then like you said before that is 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 what kind of behavior do you want mm -hmm. your what, what what kind of behavior does your culture drive and that's that's really important um you know you can you can't really get away with it anywhere um but sometimes at large companies it could get masked at a startup it's mm -hmm. out in the open i mean that's it you you, you yeah. have to nail that so I, I i appreciate you bringing up all these points because it's very important for uh early stage companies listening to to hear how important this really is and how important it still is at a large company like amazon yeah and, and i'll um, tell you it, it's hard yeah. you know yeah. like it's not right. easy to to go out right everything again sounds good in practice um but you know it's it's really hard to to go and and like when you're inundated with so many things right like every there's a fire everywhere and now it's like okay go and like you know define like this hiring process right like you know how do we hire for this behavior like nobody wants to think about that right but but again you know think of the consequences right the earlier you are right i think the more devastating the consequences could be for hiring the the wrong person right and and it depends on the role right i mean not everybody not every role right certain values right or aspects of culture are going to be more important for certain roles right and so you also have to you know kind of think about that it's not a one size fits all everyone should generally right align with the values but there's going to be certain ones where you're going to say hey you know this absolutely has to you know I, I absolutely have to see this in this individual it's it's you know otherwise it's a red flag right um so so figuring out how you assess for that i think is is you know a bit of an exercise so it, it's not easy right even for big companies um it, it's not easy right you know you make wrong hires and it's unfortunate but i think the stakes are higher for startups right because again you really want somebody that that believes in the vision mm -hmm. Yeah, and so before we we move on, we did get one question in. It's pretty pertinent to this, so I'm going to go ahead and just drop this in here now. the The question is, what would be the best indicator or snapshot of culture, as for a person in their job search? In other words, when um, one only has a few conversations during an interview process, what are the best things to look for to ensure it's a good fit? And just to clarify, this is from the perspective of someone interviewing. I'm guessing, I think okay. so, yes, yep. Yeah, so when you're interviewing, I mean, it's just as important, right? We keep talking about this from the startup perspective, but you know, the 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 longer that I've been doing this, I feel like everything is about fit and timing, right? You know, when someone doesn't work out, it, it has nothing to, to, to do with, you know, who they are or, or their experiences, right? It's just for whatever reason, something broke down, right, in the process, and they just weren't a good fit, right, for whatever the company was looking for at that time, or maybe they were in the wrong role. Um, I think for for you know, it depends on on what you're looking for, right? I think for me, what's really important is a is a is a culture where there's you know transparency, right, where you know there aren't things kind of you know hidden, where you're able to ask questions, right, and you feel like. Um, you're able to access people and information and things like that. So for that, I would kind of, you know, ask also, you know, what does the onboarding process look like, right? You know, if you know you're somebody that, right, probably needs a little bit more handholding because it's a new, you know, role or a new skill set, then you probably don't want a company that's just like, oh, we haven't really thought about that. You know, we have some docs written, right? You're just going to figure it out on your own. But for some people, they thrive in that kind of culture, right? So I guess, you know, taking a step back, right, what I'm trying to say is a lot a lot of it also depends on what you're looking for because it's about fit right so first is kind of looking inwards right and thinking hey what kind of role or challenge or opportunity am i looking for right and then seeing if the startups you know check those boxes right i think for me a healthy company is always someone again who's upfront right you know you should be able to ask how many how much months of run rate do you have right when was the last time you raised um, capital, right? What's the next plan for fundraising, you know, especially for people who need a little bit more stability, right, and have families or whatnot. Those are totally legitimate questions to ask, right? If, you know, you're not able to get a clear answer, that could be a red flag, right? You know, what, what, not necessarily they're hiding something, but if that's the communication um, strategy, I would be a little bit wary of that. Um, for me, I feel like, especially for people a little bit earlier in their career as well, it's like, you know, you're, you always want 
um, an environment where you can be coached and grow, right? Because I think that's, that's, I feel like for me, that was a huge, um, that attracted me to startups, right? Is, you know, I was the second scientist. I didn't know anything, but I was willing to roll up my sleeves and work hard and learn. Um, so I got to learn about everything, right? I got to, you know, manage engineers. I got to learn about software engineering at a very high level, right? But enough to, to talk about it confidently, right? To customers and things like that. So I got to learn about marketing, right? And kind of, you know, strategy. I was in those conversations with Big Pharma, right? Um, talking about deals and things like that. So um, for me, that's important. It's like, okay, what does the the growth opportunity, you know, look like? And then of course it's up to you to, to figure out, you know, what what to make of it. Um, and then I would ask, you know, just kind of like, I, I think, <laughs> just talk to maybe some of the people right there, um, you know, you'd be surprised at how honest people are, right? If they love it, you can tell if there's like horrible work life balance, or just, you know, not much freedom or flexibility, like people will tell you, right? So get, you know, say, hey, can I get coffee with, you know, somebody or whatnot, people are surprisingly honest. And I think generally, people are willing to help, right? If it's, you know, a red flag, um, you'll, you'll find um, signals of that. Um, you just have to look for it. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, and, and actually they wrote in to uh, say thank you and all great points. Um, great. So, um, okay. I want to move on to fundraising. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of take this chunk by chunk. Um, Non-dilutive funding to de-risk the idea. This This trend is increased in, in seed rounds. Um, what do you mean by that? I think what we used to see um, was sort of, you know, there was VC money for tech startups, right? And then kind of everybody else is like a small, medium business or, or whatnot, right? But I think, um, you know, healthcare life sciences is one of those spaces where that's merging and the area is getting gray, right? So that's exciting because now you have a lot of um, not you know, you have tons, right? Not just a lot of, but lots of um, VCs, right? That specialize in healthcare and life sciences investments. Um, so with that, you know, I guess in the, in the, in the past, right, it was like, okay, well, either you were this startup, right, like kind of high growth, high potential, and you needed a bunch of capital to get going before you could generate revenue, or you were just this, you know, kind of lifestyle business, right? But I think, again, that's changing, and there isn't one path or trajectory that's right for raising capital. Um, I was laughing because I just saw on LinkedIn, it was like path to fundraising, you know, for like a, a startup, right? And it was like, that, that doesn't exist, you know? So yeah. if anybody tries to tell you that, it doesn't exist, right? There's no right. magic formula of how much you need to raise, when you need to raise, right? Like it, it's completely different. I mean, I've seen companies that are able to bootstrap because they're revenue positive, right? Um, that's incredible, right? So, you know, it's not everything, you know, tons of VC back companies go poof, right? All the time. So there's no right formula. So don't let anyone tell you that. But what I'm starting to see, you know, because especially because I'm also working with a lot of these top tier university innovation programs is that, um, you know, if they're kind of, it aligns with your strategy to go and do like an SBIR, right, or go through NIH seed offices, um, that's an awesome way to get some non-dilutive funding. So you hold on, right, to more equity in your company. Um, but also it helps you de-risk the idea if you do want to go for venture back funding, right? So I'm starting to see a lot more when we see a seed investment from a VC firm. Um, a lot of these companies have also gotten SBIRs, which I find to be pretty awesome. Um, you know, so it's not black and white anymore, right? They're not mutually exclusive. And I would say, it, you know, you should absolutely think of grants and non-dilutive funding as part of your strategy. The pitfall is that they take a while, right? There's resources you have to put in. I mean, anyone who's written a grant, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's tough, right? You have to spend some time doing it and funding cycles are long. Um, but what's cool is, you know, I think, and especially for NIH, right? Um, you know, I think they used to do more sort of therapeutics, right, life sciences, but now they're getting into health tech as well. Um, and they, you know, they're basically like America seed fund, right, in terms of the amount of money that they give out to startups. And again, it's completely non-dilutive. 
Um, and SBIRs have so many phases. You know, I've heard of companies that basically go on to do like a post phase two, which is they're basically, you know, and that becomes millions of dollars, right? It's basically like a, a pre seed or seed round. And again, non dilutive. So, um, you know, definitely don't write it off. It takes a little bit more work and it's a little bit of a different strategy. Um, but I would say also if you're working in an area where, again, the market is not billion with a B, right? Um, Grants are a great way to do that, right? So a lot of the NIH's initiative is to support work um, in areas where the market isn't huge, right? Um, so that that could be interesting as well. Yeah, Ian, great points. Um, I will say, you know, personally, I could talk about, I could talk about this for a whole separate episode or a whole separate <laughs> webinar series. Um, but but to point people in a direction, so so there is no one rate away, no one way to raise money. If you if you go to the Project MedTech podcast, there's a whole separate series on raising capital. It's called MedTech Money. If if you want to, if that that point will be reiterated if you listen to any of those episodes. And then uh, another quick one is you talk about NIH and NIH and funding. It's perfect timing because on Friday we'll be dropping an episode with two people from the NIH on how to uh, or different different grant programs are available. So if, if you're interested in that awesome. at all. We'll, we'll table that for here, but you can check out more information on, on projectmedtech.com. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, and we're doing pretty good on time here, um, accelerators, incubators, mentorship, this is a difficult, a, a difficult area, a difficult question, but it's a really, really um, important consideration for early stage startups, and it's such a key it could shape so much of your company based on such an early decision on mm -hmm. how you want to shape your company. Do you join an accelerator? Do you incubate the company? Or do you just reach out to mentors and run it that way and give them board seats and let them shape it? So there's so much there. I'm curious on, on your thoughts. How do you select the right program? You've seen a bunch of startups. I mean, what do they do? And then I also understand there's a AWS healthcare accelerator. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, so yeah, we just launched that. a couple okay, months. Great. Okay. Awesome. So I think to start with, um, this is going to sound a little bit out there, but it's 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 kind of like the, the best way to think about any time you need to like sort of make a decision, right? I mean, it kind of goes back to the question about you know what do I look for in a company? How do I know it's a fit for me? Well, you have to know what you're looking for, right? And kind of work backwards from that. So that's that that's this other mechanism we had at at, at AWS where it's like work backwards, right, from what you need, right, and then you can kind of map out the steps that you need, right, but that means you have to understand what your near-term goal is, medium-term, long-term, right, and I think that's the hardest part is defining that. Once you have that defined, it's easy to go and find resources and stepping stones to get to where you need. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of these different programs, again, I think they should absolutely be used as part of your strategy um, for raising money or just advancing and growing your company, right, so First, I think the different considerations that um, you should think about, right, in terms of selecting these different programs, um, you know, so I, I work with all of the top accelerators, incubators, um, you know, so, so I know a lot of how they work, the ins and outs, but I think you want to first decide, okay, basically going back, what am I looking for, right? If you're looking for funding, um, then yes, accelerators can do that for you, right? So typically they come with you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. They're going to take X amount of equity that's typically set in public. So you'll know, right? For example, YC does that, Illumina Accelerator does that, right? Some other programs do that. Um, accelerators are going to be a set timeline, typically three to six month program, um, where it's a set schedule, right? And the, the goal of that is at the end of that, you have some sort of, you're going from idea, right? Or, you know, early product to MVP that you can, um, you know, have a proper demo, and then the program invites their network of investors. So the goal of all of this is to raise money at the end of that, right? So they give you a little bit of money to keep you, you know, kind of going and sustain yourself for those couple of months. You give them X amount of equity. Um, typically, I've seen anywhere, you know, eight to 10%, right, for a couple hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it's a lot, but, you know, it could help jumpstart, right, depending on if they're able to get you access, right, to a network of investors that you didn't have to get you to that next step. It's totally worth it. Um, cool. So first, you want to think of funding, right? If you need funding, you could look at some accelerators, right? They could be really good for you. Um, incubators don't do that, right? Incubators are just sort of, you know, they incubate companies, right? They're kind of launch pads. They typically provide um, subsidized labs, 
space, right? For, you know, life sciences companies, if you need bench space, et cetera, devices, right? They have all of that shared equipment. You just pay a subsidized fee and get access to all of that. You don't, what does it get you? Well, you don't have to worry about any of it, right? You don't have to go and find your own or buy, right? Capital equipment, which is impossible. It's very expensive. You don't have to worry about safety or waste or anything like that. And they typically partner with um, vendors for reagents and things like that. So everything is right there. Um, Second thing is you want to think about, again, like the stage of company, right? Like, what are you looking for? You know, if it's not funding, then maybe you're looking for mentorship, right? Maybe you're looking for um, an industry advisor to open some doors for you, right? Or to connect you with some contacts in the industry. Maybe you're just looking for a community of other, I don't know, CEOs, CTOs, whatever, to share best practices on hiring, right? And stuff like that. Uh, maybe you're looking for, you know, again, like go to market channels, right? Maybe you're actually looking for those partners. Um, so you really have to kind of figure out what it is you're looking for. It could be multiple things, right? Um, you can find them in one program. You may have to do successive programs, et cetera. Um, but the first thing is, so, so those are kinds of, you know, the things that sort of, of all the things you could look for, what are the possibilities? Um, so that leads me to, to talk about, you know, for example, I'll, I'll give you one, which is the AWS Healthcare Accelerator, right? So typically accelerators, and this is a bit of a misnomer, I feel like, typically accelerators, you think early stage, right? Because again, it's really meant to go from idea to MVP to raise seed round. Um, but the Healthcare Accelerator, you know, we we decided to, to run it in conjunction with our public sector team because we felt like there was a, a gap and some value we could offer um, before growth later stage companies with go-to-market support, right? So for these, um, for this program, we were actually looking for companies that are revenue generating, right? They already have customers, but they're looking to grow and expand. And where we felt like we could provide value is by introductions to enterprises that could be their customers in the public sector space. So in healthcare, right, it's nonprofit, you know, healthcare providers, uh, academic, right, research centers, government, et cetera. And so that's that gives you a sense of how niche, right, and nuanced these programs can be. Um, you know, if you're selling biotech to pharma, right, even though your growth stage, whatever, like it's not gonna be a fit, right? You're not selling into those organizations. So it's very important to understand a, what you're looking for and B, right? Kind of vet the, the, the program and make sure that it fits your needs. Very cool. Um, very interesting, you know, model for the accelerator as well. The one thing I did write down that I just wanted to comment on was you mentioned the, you know, the equity dilution, right? They're going to take so much equity for a couple hundred thousand dollars. And, um, I will get questions from startups frequently about that of, Hey, is this fair? Does this look right? Is that too much? And and I always tell them that, you know, it's like, would you rather own 50% of nothing or 30% of, you know, uh, yeah. a, a multi-million dollar company or something like that, right? It's just, it's a basic example, but, yeah. but that's, you know, the kind of math you got to do in your head when you're, when you're thinking about this, people get so hung up on equity. Yeah. And equity means literally nothing unless you exit. Yeah, 99% so, um, of zero is zero, even worse, <laughs> negative, right? So no, absolutely. I mean, and you have to, you have to really understand. I think yeah, a lot of founders will bulk at that number, right? Because it seems high, right? Especially if this is your baby, your idea, you nurtured it, you felt like you've gotten there, but like. Are you able to get it to the next milestone, right? Of funding, of, of BD, whatever that looks like without any help if you are great right if you aren't i mean you know that's that's a small price to pay right i would say um if you think of yc and some of the the companies they've helped accelerate right not just in the software space but also in you know healthcare life sciences so i i'm sure you know none of them are <laughs> if i had to guess right going back right. and being like oh darn i wish i didn't you know take their money right i mean it, yeah you know, it, it helped them get to that next um milestone right so you you really have to you know, think yeah. about, yeah. Oh, Dwayne, I can't hear you. I accidentally muted myself when I was going down to the questions. I apologize. Um, so uh, I want to ask some of the audience questions, um, okay. and then I, I have another one as well. So so if you're if you're listening, please pile on the questions. We'll, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, the one question came in earlier, it was, are there consulting firms or recruiters, specifically in Houston, but I'd be curious about the rest of the US or world, that can help hire the right coders that understand the requirements of software controls? This person's experience has been a lot of pushback with software engineers. 
So it's, are there firms that you can hire for software engineers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's entire right industry um, that do that. Um, there's also coding boot camps, right, as well. So, um, you know, that you yeah. can connect directly with, right, depending on the level of experience. Um, but again, right, these organizations are only going to be as good as, you know, how you prep them, right? It's like using a, a contractor for any work that you're doing, right? There's some you know, people think like, oh, I have this project, I got a contractor off my plate. No, right? The work is only going to be as good as the oversight and the information and context, right, that you're giving to that person. So there's absolutely organizations that, that do that. Um, I would say, you know, you'll have to, to, you know, if you have, it depends on what you need help with, right? If it's sourcing and pipelining, then yeah, they can probably help with that. You can also list on things like LinkedIn, right, and things like that. Um, but if you are having trouble, um, vetting right specific candidates then and because you know you, you're maybe you're hiring the first ai ml engineer right and because they're the first i mean that's why they're the first right um you don't know how to assess for that then i would say you know i think a good piece of advice is try to find somebody in your network right maybe somebody on the board or an advisor that may be able to connect you with somebody that could come in and just help with some sort of technical um, assessment right so it depends on where your challenge is right if it's pipeline and traction and things like that there's ways to solve it right there's organizations you can hire they'll give you tons of candidates um you can also what i suggest people do um again it kind of depends on bandwidth and resource but like you know um organized comp startups that have like blog posts and things like that right that are active you know a little bit on social media tend to also get a lot more hits right i remember at my old startup whenever we would have a press release like that's when the inquiries would come in even if we didn't have any jobs listed right they would just say like i read your article and blah 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 it's awesome like you know this is my background is there anything open right so any publicity that you can create around yourself um also inbound requests are the best right those are the people that took the time to read the article right are really passionate we talked about culture and hiring right those are the types of people you want it's people that align with the vision so that's that's the pipeline stuff right if, again if you don't understand how to interview technically this person then i would say look to somebody in your network that can help Okay. Um, that organization is unlikely going to help with that, right? The, mm -hmm. the recruiting organization. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I had, and this was the one I, I had mentioned that I wanted to save for later, um, just in case there's any people who are listening who aren't already entrepreneurs or thinking about it, or they're still in school or whatever it is. So, so you have your PhD. Um, I, I have my master's in medicinal chemistry. And so the one thing that from, from my experience, I just always remember is, it's always like you there's this added pressure that you have to stay in the field you're in right um like you have to I, I have to stay in in small molecule synthetic chemistry um you have to stay in academia it's not really you know push i'm curious on your experience and and how you you know got into startups and and, and into entrepreneurship and you know you're you're in the health tech field but it, you, you know, it's not necessarily directly related to your PhD. Yeah, it's not molecular right? biology. Right, right. Yeah. right. So, so I'm curious, you know, of, of that process, um, why? Was there something specific that you were like, oh, this is, this is what I love about this, and that's why you yeah. made the jump? Yeah. Yeah, for me, I mean, so I went straight into um, grad school from undergrad because I, I kind of didn't know what I wanted mm -hmm. to do, right? But I know I, you know, I loved research, right, and things like that. And so, you know, I, I got into, um, I, I visited Cornell, kind of really enjoyed it, um, the faculty and how things were set up. Um, and then, you know, through my PhD, right, I, I realized, hey, I probably don't want to do this right for the rest of my life i mean I, I so i was also the student of a new faculty member so i felt like that gave me kind of you know he was awesome i mean he did you know hands-on work with me and taught me everything but i saw how hard he worked and just kind of like you know this is the life that i would have if i entered this field as a young faculty like the best case scenario right because you know he got this awesome role and things like that um and i just didn't i don't know i, I love science but not I guess to that extent, or just, I wanted to see what else was out there. Mm -hmm. So cool. this is just, I feel like one of life's lessons where you're just like, you, you, you kind of have to like put it out to the universe, right? That you're open to new opportunities and things, and you have no idea what's going to happen. So whatever comes at you, if you can say yes, 
right? Yeah. Like I feel like we turned out so many things, but you have no idea what they're going to lead to, right? So say yeah. So this is one of just I just feel like it was a series of serendipitous events, right? So Cornell had this class on you know alternative careers, right? And back then, this is 2013. I was in Ithaca, upstate New York, like nothing around. Like it was like academia, you know, you have to go academia, right? It's not like now where I feel like every other person I meet is like spinning out a company. <laughs> and I feel like the environment is just much more friendlier to non-alternative, um, to alternative careers in science. Um, so, you know, I, I did this class, right, on alternative careers in science. That's where I met the person that ultimately told me about the role at the startup. Um, I took an entrepreneurship class, you know, with a bunch of MBAs and engineers, right? So I learned more about what, what a startup means. Um, I, I graduated and like, I didn't have anything lined up and I was kind of like, okay, well, worst case scenario, I'm going to take the summer off and, you know, if need be, I can always go back and get a postdoc, right? Like always. Um, so I just kind of took, yeah, some, some chances. And then, you know, the call came in, right? The person I met in that class was like, Hey, we're looking for somebody second scientist. I had no idea what the company was doing or anything. I didn't understand anything. Um, yeah. I, I, but I said yes. Right. And it was in San Francisco, never lived in the Bay area in my life. I just went. And so, yeah, I think the lesson is, um, I don't know if you're interested in stuff, say yes, right. There's, there's lots of opportunities everywhere, but you have to be open to it. And, um, you know, I, there's, there's no mistakes, right. It's, you know, there, everything is a learning opportunity. So. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Um, so we got about three minutes left. And so I, I, I don't want to ask any more. I could probably ask a hundred more questions, <laughs> but uh, this ends in three minutes. So, so anyways, uh, you'll see we're sharing the slide. This is some more information on, on uh, Galen Data, the Galen Cloud. Uh, again, you can always go to galendata.com. Um, you can see about Galen data, you can catch the old webinars that have been done. There's white papers, blog posts, um, you know, there, Galen data is, is, is really giving back to the med tech community in, in, in more than just a great product, but, but also just, just information. So I think, you know, go there, check it out, um, and be on the lookout for, uh, January's webinar, um, date to be determined. Um, but, but Yin, thank you uh, for giving us it was an such hour a today. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much for having me.